Okay, what is a macro lens? So there's a whole very technical, complicated definition. It basically boils down to um, you want to have a one-to-one -one magnification um, of, on your, between your subject and your lens. And what that means is if you're taking a picture of a one-inch bug, it should be one inch on your sensor. Okay, That's the easiest way of explaining it. Um, if it doesn't do one-to-one, -one, then it's not a macro lens. Here are the most popular macro lenses. Um, I've once had all of these. Uh, we'll start from the left. Uh, the left two are the Canon ones. Um, the one with the red ring, of course, is the more expensive one because you've got to pay for that red ring. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, they're 100 millimeters uh, macro lenses okay, for Canon. The one to the right, <clears throat> to the right of that is a uh, Sigma, I think it's a 150. It is a 150. No, it can't be 150. I think it's a 105. So it's a Sigma 105 macro. I actually have the 150 with me, so you can see that. It's just a little bit bigger, heavier, but it does give you 50% uh, more magnification. And finally, the uh, famous Nikon 105, uh, which I've had in the past, uh, and I sold it, and now I'm glad selling it uh, because it is an excellent lens. All these lenses have uh, IS or VR, whatever your, your, your vendor calls it, and they all can do one-to-one. -one. Now, are all lenses uh, macro lenses? If they say macro lenses on them, and absolutely not. Unfortunately, the word macro became a uh, marketing gimmick about 10 years ago, and basically it, it, it came out to, if you can get close enough to it, closer than normal, they called it a macro lens. And that was not reality because they could not do one to one magnification. That's the key. Okay? Um, notice the Tamron, excellent lens. I used to have that lens uh, for a long time. Um, so, you know, super compact, multi zoom lens. It says uh, macro right on the box. But notice it can't do one to one. The best it can do is one to two. Okay? So if you don't know what those numbers mean, you fall for macro and you're figuring you can get a nice big representation close up of your subject and that's not what you can do. This lens, I think the minimum working distance is like six to eight feet. So there's no way you're gonna get a macro uh, capability on it. But for a ultra compact super zoom lens, it's fantastic and it's Tamron, so it's like 500 bucks or something. The one on the left, notice it says macro and notice next to macro it says one to one. So that is a true macro lens, because it can do one-to-one -one magnification of what you're looking at. So don't be fooled on macro or micro. Now this terminology has gone away uh, because macro lenses have fallen in price. Um, I think the first Canon micro lens I bought, maybe a decade ago, it was like close to two grand. And now all macro lenses, especially the 100 millimeter new ones, are less than $1,000. They're around the $800 range. Um, and this is full frame macro. If you have a DX camera and you buy a DX macro, it's even cheaper. Okay, so but back then it was very expensive, so they tried to take advantage of that. Uh, but most of those lenses have gone by. Working distance. This is key for macro lenses. And this is really what I, the biggest characteristic I use when I look at macro lenses. How close can that lens come to my subject? Okay, that's what I think of when I think of macro. If it's five, six feet away, it's not a macro lens to me. Okay, even for something 150 millimeters, I want to get as close to a few feet. Uh, for example, if you're doing an insect, you don't want to get too close, but you want to get close enough so you get a one-to-one -one out of it. Okay, so uh, for me, working distance is key. Uh, when I do flowers, when I do textures, as you see here, the closer I can get to that subject, the better for me. Every single lens has a limitation, right? There's, there is a limit to how close you can get. The nice thing for a standard 60 or 90 millimeter macro is that um, you can get within about an inch of, that, uh, of the front element of your lens to your subject. So you can get really, really close, which is really nice. Depth of field. So we had a whole class talking about aperture and depth of field uh, two months ago. 
Um, but uh, depth of field is very key, and this is the frustrating part with macro photography. Because you're doing uh, macro and you're doing one to one, uh, your depth of field, even at uh, 5, 6, f8, or f11, is still very, very thin. Um, and the plane of photographing becomes key, and I'll show you what plane means. I'll actually show you that. Uh, but your depth of field uh, is very, very narrow. Even if you're doing F32, if you're thinking of a standard lens, F32, you can see from here to the sky, right? Uh, but on a macro lens, because of the one-to-one -one magnification, that's not the case. Uh, with macro, I usually shoot F18 or, or better to get the depth of field I want. Uh, and of course, when you're increasing the aperture to get a better depth of field, guess what happens to your lights? It shrinks, right? You get less and less light as you're increasing your aperture. If you go from, you know, most uh, macro lenses are F2.8s. So if you're going to go from F2.8 to F11 to get a good depth of field, uh, you're going to lose what, uh, five times the light. Okay, so. Um, that's why you need special light. Focusing. Macro photography, it's almost key to do manual focusing. Uh, because you're shooting something up close. Today we're going to look at textures. To the lens, <coughs> sure it sees the texture, but it doesn't know where it's going to focus. It's just a big goblet book, it can be anywhere. That's why it's key to manual focus when you're doing macro photography. Uh, if, you're doing, if you're shooting petals on a flower, chances are it's not going to know that you want the head of that, that structure or the bottom of the structure or you want the petals, I mean, it's going to guess and it's up to you. That's why it's key to use manual focus when you're doing macro photography. Alright, we'll talk about planes in a minute. Alright, textures. As I said, well, I'm not going to show you flower photography or insect photography today. Uh, we're going to talk about textures. Uh, and why are textures uh, more important or easier, I should say, than flowers or insects, which are probably a lot more popular with macro photography. They don't move. <laughs> there you go. They don't move, right? Um, when you're doing macro photography, as I mentioned, your depth of field is very, very narrow. So uh, you have to stabilize that flower, because even a very small wind is going to make the flower move. And that's going to be enough, even a slight movement. We're not talking about you know, gale wind. We're talking about a very subtle, slight movement. It's going to throw whatever you just painstakingly focused on in two and a half, three minutes, it's going to throw it off. Right? Or it's going to move just enough from the wind that uh, you're not going to get a constant focus and you're fighting the focus. I've seen you know, these crazy things uh, at the Botanical Garden with photographers, they put a stake, they got paper clips, they're paper clipping the flower uh, onto this, this stake to try to get into that move. Uh, that all may work, and then, and then they use not a tripod. They don't use a tripod and you have got You gotta get going walk away. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very, very key um, because things don't move, we have more control. I mean, today we're gonna be in this room, we're shooting objects, right? And I'll show you a, a bunch of different objects. So you have a lot more control, and uh, when you're looking at something, you won't know. You probably don't know what it is, and that's that's what makes macro photography cool. Because you're looking at such a small piece of it, magnified, that unless someone says, "Oh, I know what that is," you know, it's really hard to, to guess. Okay, what textures can we take? Um, I brought sand. Um, I didn't find any good pieces of wood, but there is uh, a piece of wood with some moss on it. And that, that moss, that's not moss, is it? Right. Fungus. 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 That fungus, it's actually really, really small. Sometimes you'll see fungus that's like a foot big. That's not it. <laughs> that fungus is like half an inch big. So the nice thing is it's on a piece of wood. It's pretty steady. You get your butt down there and you can take a picture. Okay. Um, sand makes some interesting textures, um, especially you can go in there, mix up the sand, and take a picture. And I brought a cup of sand so we can try that. Um, leaves. Leaves are very cool. And I'm not talking about fall foliage, beautiful colors. You know, that's one type of thing. But take your favorite leaf and do some macro photography on it. You know, get in, especially the underside that has all those veins and stuff, take a picture of that and appreciate how beautiful nature is 
You know, everyone looks at the top and the color, and we're all kind of cool. Turn that leaf over and take it on the underside and look at how all that structure of the, of the leaves are. Metal. Um, I have not taken some good metal photography, um, but that's, that sounded pretty funny, metal photography. Anyway, um, but that's my goal for this year. Um, I think on the Fox River, closer to Batavia, there's this Fox structure in, yeah, on the river front in, in, uh, in all metal, and it's all different metals, and some of it had, is starting to rust. That's a good opportunity to take um, macro photography. And I've got lots of pictures of the thing because it's kind of cool. And it's this metal uh, um, statue of a fox. But to get in and actually take some macro photography of the, of the uh, metal itself is very interesting. Stone. Uh, I brought a few stones here. Uh, and I, I think both of them are from a beach. I think I brought a Jamaican stone here. Um, but different kinds of stones, and then try to get the textures, especially if, it, if they're spied with different colors, try to get uh, the pictures of all of that. Uh, bricks. Uh, bricks have, especially weathered bricks, have a lot of beautiful textures on there for you to take. Um, and finally, rope. You know, of course, you have a good piece of rope. And I'm not talking about the, the, the fancy nylon stuff that you buy today, but a good old thread rope. That if you can find some of that, it we'll makes some beautiful stuff. Uh, the picture in the center is a cactus. Uh, it's the hairs of a cactus. This is a very, very small cactus, uh, and those hairs are probably a few millimeters long. Uh, a nice thing this is a plant, it's indoors, uh, very controlled. I pretty much set this up. It happened to be uh, right by a window, so I did not need any artificial lighting whatsoever, and I took a picture of that. Um, you see a small version of it just because it's it's on the screen, but when you look at the actual photo, it looks you know humongous. So these small hairs that were a few millimeters looks humongous on the uh, on the screen. And finally, did anyone tell me what the third picture is? Broccoli. Broccoli, right. So again, a piece of broccoli just happens to be on the table. Fruits and vegetables are very interesting, especially if you can like cut them in certain ways to show the uh, inners of all the fruits or the, uh oh, we gotta go, I'm just kidding. Uh, the uh, fruits, all the vegetables, and take a really close up shot of it. Uh, another trick is uh, when you cut the fruit as it sweats, as it drips, you know, water photography, and you know, we all love taking pictures of flowers and stuff after rain because it just looks beautiful. Okay, any picture about what, I'm sorry, any questions about what to take? And again, everyday household items, you can, you know, ideally do this indoors because you're controlling the environment, right? That's key. Okay, find a texture. We're going to cover equipment in a second. We're going to cover lighting in a second. Um, and then play with angles and depth of field. Those are the kind of things you experiment with. Okay. There is a great book. I have it here somewhere. It's called Creative Close-Ups. It's by Harold Davis's Creative Series. There's like six or eight books. And this book is a, a really good on tips and techniques of photographing different stuff. Uh, there's lots of insects and flowers in there, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't concentrate on just that. It's, it's everything under the gamut. It's a really good book, as, and it's written, uh, you know, like step-by-step -step tips and techniques, which is really easy to read. All right, let's let's do some shooting. Any questions about the presentation itself? Yes. So I understand the one-on-one, -one, uh, where it recreates the image, uh, the same, the same uh, ratio or same. Yeah. Um, so does it, what is what is the one-to-two, or what is, what is the what is the disadvantage? It's half, so it would be you not just, as... Would you just crop it? You would crop it, yep. Yep, and you would have to do close processing to get the same picture as you would without boxes. Any other questions yeah. before we... Yes? Have you ever done anything just using uh, close-up rings or like filter rings or anything out of plus one? Plus um, plus one. That's a good question. So there are, instead of buying a macro lens, there are other ways of getting macro lights. Macro light. Wow, it's beautifully red outside. Sorry. Um, it's uh, the, the sunset is beautiful outside. Um, but there's other ways. If you don't want to spend a few hundred dollars on a lens, um, there are other ways of getting close to macro photography. The, the key is uh, 
uh, minimizing your working distance, right? That's the key. How can you get that subject closer and closer to that lens so you can get as close to a one-to-one -one as possible, okay? And there are, uh, instead of buying a macro um, uh, lens, uh, you can put extension filters, uh, uh, and there they are. You can get, um, I think uh, you can get the brand name ones for several hundred dollars. You can get the generic ones which are just as good for like a tenth of that. <laughs> Um, and they're, they're, this comes in different widths, different sizes. Um, so they are, they force your, your uh, lens into manual mode. But like I said, you're going to be shooting manual focus anyway, so it should not be a big deal. And by adding space between your sensor and uh, your lens, you're basically moving your subject closer to that lens. That's what they do. Yes, Josh. I was going to reference specifically yeah. your little filter to put it on the end of your lens. Um, I bought several yeah. different kinds. It's like 60 bucks or so. For yes. Yeah. You can get them for 20 to 60 bucks. You can spend 125 They don't offer the same quality at, at the same proximity to the subject. So, you know, you can put those on a 18 to 55 that your Nikon or Canon might come to come with and get really close, but your distortion on the outside. Yeah isn't as good a quality as a straight macro. So if you're going to get an inexpensive option, go with the barrel connectors instead. Um, there's, no the, there's no glass in here. Yeah. No. And his, his, his actually are nice. They have uh, um, the electronics built in. So you can you still control the aperture. You don't lose all the I mean, something like this I've been using for 100 years. And, um, I don't you don't look at Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get the, the edge to edge set corner to corner. Yeah. You know, if you want that, if you want a creative pin, yeah, these things are great for that too. Because, you know, it's just, you don't have that sharpness, but you know, as compared to spending, you know, most of thousand bucks. Sure. And if you, you know, you didn't hear that. So there are filters that go in front, the screw in front of your lens, that basically give you a close-up, and they, they allow your subject to get closer to that lens, so that um, you can take. Uh, pictures of macro life. You know, again, the, the key is getting closer to that one to one. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the disadvantage, as you said, is you get vignette, right? It forces the, the edges are uh, not in focus and they get darker. But, you know, what? You know, cameras are 16 megapixel these days or more. You know, if you're going to crop the center, then you don't care, right? And you're going to spend $20 versus uh, $600. And, and to you, that may be a great buy, you know. So there are ways of, of uh, working in macro just to try it out and test it and see how good it is for not very expensive. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Have you ever done the adapter where you flip the lens around backwards? Yeah. I have never done that. I've seen people do that. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the comment was you can take your lens and they sell adapters, so you take your lens and you literally flip it and, and screw it onto your body. So you're flipping your lens, um, and then with the adapters, you're screwing it in. That basically gives you a much, much smaller working distance uh, by doing that. I have technically never, I've never tried it, uh, but that does seem cool. That should be something fun to try, Let's see if it'll work, yeah. And people do it with like, you know, the 50 millimeter plastic lens. You don't need a fancy lens for this. Just your standard 50 millimeter kit lens, um, and I think that's what the adapters are most popular with for Canon and Nikon. And you literally flip it upside down with this adapter so it screws onto the body and take a picture. Okay, it's it's very cool. Another thing to try for a very small amount of cost. Right? Yes. I've done it, and um, the advantage to it is you can look at how a lens is designed. All lenses are designed so that it's kitchen. The focal plane on, on the back side of the lens towards the camera is perfectly vertical. It has to hit the film or the sensor perfectly square. When you take that lens and turn it around, you put that strength of the focal plane out on this side of it, and with the narrow, narrow depths of field that you have with macro kinds of photography, um, it's, it's very high quality reproduction. 
And so it's something something to consider. And the better the quality of the lens, the better the quality of the photograph. Yep. There's also another alternative is that some uh, companies, some lens manufacturers make um, lenses that are only designed for use on bellows, an antique term. Most of you guys don't know bellows, but Doug does. And uh, basically what it is is it's a lens without a focusing mechanism, and the focusing is all done with the bellows. And again, it's a, it's a high quality reproduction format. Again, lots of ways to get an actual photography. And, and cool things to try for very inexpensive, especially these camera shows. I'm sure they'll have uh, a lot of these things there for really inexpensive costs for you to pick up and just try. All right. Um, we set up um, shelves outside. Okay. So people, so people can grab something and find somewhere up here to take a picture. Okay. Tables here, tables here. Yeah, we'll do it in a minute. Let me tell Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, so nice. Yeah, I've got maybe 10 more minutes. So uh, this setup is the same setup I used two months ago uh, for my aperture photography. Uh, uh, Nikon camera works with Canon and Nikon. I've tried it with both since I own both cameras. It works perfectly with both. Standard uh, USB 3.0 cable. Uh, it depends on what USB port you have on the camera. This is a D800, so it has the 3.0. Uh, if you have uh, the, uh, a, a one or two year old camera, it has the standard micro USB. So it's just a, a USB cable that works with whatever USB port you have on your camera. And it will work with point of shoots too. Okay? Not all of them, but some of them. Connect it to your computer, and I want a piece of software that is absolutely free. And it works with both. Can it works with all three: um, Canon, Nikon, and Sony. As long as you can, as long as your camera has a USB port that it can be controlled through, you can use this. Okay. Software is called Digicam Control. Absolutely free. Recognizes your camera. Um, when you connect your camera through a USB cable to your laptop. Uh, and this, uh, your laptop should make a noise that says, you know, you have a new device connected, and I recognize it, right? If you get an, a driver error, the software is not going to work because it relies on Windows or the Mac system to make a connection to your camera, right? So if your if your camera does not make a valid connection with your laptop, it's not going to work. Uh, but if it is, if it does make a connection, notice on the bottom left, it knows it's a D hundreds. Uh, and then I have full control of this camera uh, through the laptop, which is really, really nice. Uh, some manufacturers charge you several hundred dollars for this software, uh, but you know it's it's freeware. You can download it. It's, it's uh, oh, you can't see it. I'm sorry. It's it's up there. It's Digicam Control. Digicam. Yep. D I G I C A M Control. Very, exactly, it's a very small footprint. It's a, it relies on a .NET that's installed on your machine to do everything. So, you know, it relies on stuff that's already on your machine to control your camera. So it's a very, very small piece of software. Um, and it does great things. All right, so um, I can go to live view mode if your camera has it. Um, and this is the shell that I have here. Um, I can control the ISO and the aperture right from the software. Um, this is um, the newer Nikon 60mm full frame macro, right? It is, uh, it's inexpensive, it's, it was half the cost of the 105, um, and it's, it's, it's really good. Really, really nice piece of lens. So, <clears throat> unless you go to 2.8, usually about 3.2, notice when I go to 3.2, what happens? Um, my depth of field becomes very, very narrow. So this is a shell, right? So it's on the table. Um, it has a very uh, concave uh, side to it, and it's focused. I think I saw the things pop up here. So that means the plane of focus is right here. So notice anything above this plane. This is just some residue on that plane, but it's a little bit higher than that plane by a few millimeters, and notice it's not in focus. So literally a few millimeters off your focus plane will not be in focus. 
Certainly everything behind this, this plane is also not in focus. Uh, that's why uh, manual focus is key, because you need to control, is this part important to you or not? Uh, I, it looks exactly like that, so I kind of like that that's uh, on the same plane, but literally a few uh, millimeters away, it's not in focus. So you get to decide by the manual focus uh, what you want to take a picture of. And I can change. Focus. Okay, what I just did is I moved my focus from here to up here, right? Manually, switch the the uh, uh, the manual focus ring on the camera. This is not in focus anymore. It's focused over here. If you look at the shell, the difference between this plane and that plane is a few millimeters. Uh, but again, I'm shooting at f2.8 to get the maximum light. That's why your, your focus and your manual focus is critical. If I increase my aperture to get more of this in focus, okay, notice what happens. I'm still focused over there, right? I did not touch the focus at all. I, the only thing I did was switch on my aperture, and now that and this is in focus. You've never once seen that. Okay, so that's why I'm playing with, um, that is on. Anyway, um, that's why manual focus and playing with your aperture is critical in macro photography, right? Um, it all depends on what, how much of your subject you want in focus, okay? To me, that's not what I want. I don't want a picture of a shell. I want cool details of a shell, so I'm going to, you know, push it back down here. The nice thing about this software, um, you can adjust all the parameters of your camera here, just playing with that, um, including ISO. Um, notice I'm changing the aperture, and it's automatically changing my speed to give me a good picture when I'm in live mode, right? You saw that um, speed go up and down as I'm changing stuff. Let's say picture. Okay, that's pretty much the picture we saw um, as we were looking in life. And again, look at how much capability you have for something that's free, right? It tells you exactly where it's focused. Um, it gives you all of the parameters. It gives you a histogram. And you can start playing with exposure and see how it affects your image, which is really cool. Good question. I have never I think so, but I've never shot raw with this. So you just want to have camera set up to raw with the software is terribly good. Yeah, let's try that. What's the, what's the question? I didn't hear it. Can we shoot raw? Can we shoot raw? Of course. So I switched the camera to raw right now. Instead of JPEG. So if I take an image. It's raw because it takes way too long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it works for raw also. Oh yeah. 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 Where? Right. right. Yes. Yeah, sure does. Bam! Right there. I just know it from the speed. You know, raw image is so much bigger than a JPEG. To see how much it takes to actually process it is. <laughs> so it, it, it works. Okay. Let's go back to our. Um, notice the lighting, um, standard, I'm glad they have this in the back, standard lamp is my lighting. I prefer to take things in the day so I can use natural light as much as possible. Not full head on sunlight, but you know, off, off indirect sunlight works really, really well for me. If, I'm on, if my exposure is longer, I don't care because it's on a tripod, right? So a tripod is, is almost required. But, uh, and this is just standard light, standard tabletop light. Um, when I was doing this, I really wanted something better, something to control the lights better. And I found this. This is a ring flash. Uh, a Nikon and camera uh, and Canon will both sell you this for 
a million dollars, very close to it. I think it's like $600 or some outrageous amount of money. $40, uh, because it doesn't say Nikon or Canon. Uh, and how do you use this? It comes with a whole bunch of different lens connectors. So, do we have a lens? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, did I say off? I probably said off. Uh, I'm going to turn this off. Alright, so you basically have to find the attachment that works for your lens thread size. Okay, this is 62, I believe. Wow, first chance. Okay, take this, screw it onto the front of your lens, as if it were a filter. Okay, screw it. And it comes with. All these sizes. I think it goes from 72 down to 52. Mm. Okay, all the different sizes. So screw it on, it looks like that, just as if you were screwing on a filter. Take the light. It will slip on. Jesus, oops. Okay, easier to do with one hand. Here we go. So it slips on the flange that it gives you, okay? Just like that. Next, you take the battery source. Very cheap, inexpensive. It has AA batteries in here. It hooks to the top of the camera. It doesn't use the power from the camera. There's batteries in here. It does have a power input, so you can put DC power input. Connect this to this. And turn it on. Lots of lights. For how much? Forty dollars. The manufacturer name or generic. I will post this online. <laughs> it was an Amazon buy, so you know it was one of those cheap Amazon buys. So let's see the difference, right? I take the camera. Look at the power bank. It all comes in a kit. Everything comes in one box. Everything I just connected was one box. It comes with all the flanges, it even comes with a tool. It's not really a color wheel, it's just a protector, but I thought it was a cool color. Uh, yeah, all this, oh, here, I will tell you what it is, because I've got the manual in here. Oh, chum me, Mike. <laughs> it is Chromo. C-H-R-O-M-O -O is the vendor. Macro LED ring light, ring 48. So it's a light, not a flash, right? It's a light, yes. It's not a flash, it's a on-off light. Right. Yeah, point okay. out. How does the LED affect your color balance? Ah, so that you will see. Um, it doesn't, it's not too bad. So if I turn it on, connect the camera again. Um, turn on our light. Now, I go to live view. Yeah, there it goes. There it is. It is whiter, but it is a heck of a lot brighter. I'm also very, very close. Uh, But that's pretty impressive, you know, versus that for 40 bucks. James? Yes. It's now $29.98. Less than $40. <laughs> Less than 40 bucks, as we speak. <laughs> so I was really happy with this. And, you know, when I do, uh, obviously this won't work very well outdoors when you're doing flower. Well, flowers, it would work because you're, it could be used as a fill light, right? Uh, but with insects and stuff, probably won't work. But when you're doing indoor shooting, uh, you get you know really a, a huge amount of light. It does show. I mean, I can see it from here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just just the front. There you go. Um, your white balance is a little bit off. I mean, it's an LED light, so it's wider. Um, but you can easily adjust that. Right, you can easily adjust the white balance just to get some of that whiteness out of it. Actually, I think the color right now is more realistic than before. 
It does. It actually looks exactly right. It's like the shell as I'm looking at it. Because with this light, I've seen more of the blemishes yeah. that I couldn't see when it, with the hot, you know, with the iridescent light dots. Um, so I love this, and I use this a lot. Um, if you keep it on for an hour, the batteries don't last very long. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, it's a really, really good buy for less than forty dollars. Okay. So you can take this picture. And notice, I think that is a factor of four. So I'm having, notice I took this. I haven't changed anything other than the light source. This was 1 30th of a second. It's now 1 25th of a second. Um, it's got four times more light between this and that. You know, which is wonderful if you're doing macro photography. Okay? All right, any questions? Yes? Is that adjustable at all, the, uh, the intensity of the light? No. It's just purely on and off. I think the one I had, you could turn on one side of it. You could just have half of the one. Um, if this can do it, I would be very happy. I just haven't figured out how to do that. And as with all toys that you can buy, the sky's the limit. If you buy a $250 one, they do have more options, you know, it's sure. the same with cameras, the same with everything. So, but yeah, the, those are ridiculously awesome. So this is three settings, whole light, half right, half left. What? <laughs> <laughs> Does it say how? Is it on the right? <laughs> the features, right? Oh, okay. Is All right, so you can adjust it. I just have to figure out how. Maybe it has to do with the, 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 the other model. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I had a question about the, the, the program under under camera. Does it list the cameras? Because some of us have decided to up our game. And we yes, it does eight. list cameras. Yep. <laughs> I don't think you that part. <laughs> it will, there's a huge list of cameras on the website. Oh, OK. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Uh, we have Sorry. half an hour-ish. Um, uh, we have set up. We brought yeah. shelves. We have lots of shelves. If you brought your camera equipment, um, feel free to take some pictures. If you have Nikon, I have two macro lenses. Doug, you didn't bring your macro lens. I did. Aha! And we have about three macro lenses. So I got the 60, we have the 100, and I've got the Sigma 150. If you want to try it on your Nikon. Uh, unfortunately, I still like Nikon and macro lens, so I don't have that one. Uh, if you want to take a look at this coolness uh, for $29.95, you can. Um, and if you want to try the software or anything you like, feel free. This is your time to...